have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Keita Vanterpool. She is a chiropractor here in Washington, D.C. She has been practicing for many years. We're going to talk a little bit about your background as a chiropractor working in Washington, D.C., which I imagine you have many stories to tell about that. But you are truly a trailblazer, and I definitely want to get into all of your incredible accomplishments. But first, I want to know a little bit more about your consulting firm and, and your work here in, in D.C. as a chiropractor. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. So I am a chiropractor here in Washington, D.C., and I've been practicing here in the district, uh, the DMV area for the last, since 2004. Um, and uh, here in Washington, D.C., I basically work and live in an underserved community. And my passion is to really uh, be able to support those who would not normally seek chiropractic care to be able to experience holistic health care in a manner that others are experiencing it. You're specifically in Southeast DC, is that correct? I am. Mm -hmm. So how did you find yourself working with this particular community? Well, I was living in Atlanta um, at the time. And um, when I came to Washington DC in 2003, I, I lived in, a, you know, I'd stay with my brother who lived in Southeast. And I was like, you know, being in a suburb for so long, I felt the need to come back to a community that actually didn't have access to uh, chiropractic care. And the laws were not favorable for chiropractors to live or work in Southeast Washington, DC. So I set on a mission to basically see how I could promote chiropractic mm -hmm. in Southeast, um, attract uh, my type of, of workers in the Southeast. And um, I been, get, began this 11 year journey to uh, solicit and lobby city council, the mayor and others to help support and even the patients and, and the community to help support um, by getting petitions to see how we could uh, promote chiropractic and actually have chiropractic as a paid benefit um, mm -hmm. in Medicaid so that the unserved community could benefit from this particular type of care. That's incredible. So you lobbied for chiropractic inclusion in Medicaid in DC. Can you talk to me a little bit about what type of uphill battle that must have been and how challenging oh, it was? Oh my, yes. So it was myself and I had a team of other, of other doctors and um, the American Chiropractic Association. It was Dr. Jay Greenstein and Dr. Angela Salcido who made part of my team. And each of them had their particular specialty that they specialized in to be able to talk to uh, the leaders at the Department of Health, um, uh, Department of Health, as well as, like I said, city council. Mm -hmm. We've had several meetings with city council and with the mayor, um, um, the health, Department of Healthcare Finance with Wayne Turnage. And so it's been a, a truly a battle um, because we found that there was not parity um, when it comes to uh, benefits for beneficiaries in Washington, DC. So um, you have physical therapists that are able to do manipulation, but chiropractic manipulation was not a paid benefit. So there were some differences in what we saw that, uh, that some changes should be made um, to actually help to create access for people to have greater access to, to healthcare in Washington, DC. So um, I began the plight 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago now when David Catania was on the city council and I lobbied with him. I says, you know, why is it that, a, that chiropractic is not a part of Medicaid? He says, well, Kita, no one ever asked. Mm -hmm. And no one ever had a seat at the table. And so I found that um, in order to have, it's not a matter of being prejudiced towards a certain particular thing. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of if the information is not there or if you're not there at the table, then you're not, con you're not considered in the process. So I inserted myself into the process to help support the idea of what I wanted to see happen and achieve. Mm -hmm. And um, later on down the line, I became the, the chair of the Board of Chiropractic. So I was able to utilize some of my skill set within the board as far as regulatory uh, things are concerned as far as access to healthcare, educating the public, um, because that's what the Board of Chiropractic does. We are about public protection, safety, and inclusion. Right. And so I was able to utilize, not wearing the same hat at the same time, um, but be, being able to use one hat for one thing and the other hat as the chair of board of chiropractic for the other thing as far as uh, moving um, laws to help support creating access, really access to health care and exposure. And a, it's a long flight. Um, and Yvette Alexander, Councilwoman Alexander became um, the committee, committee chair 
I had conversations with her mm -hmm. and she was like, well, Kita, with the MCOs coming in Washington, DC, although DC Medicaid may not have you um, as part of the network, maybe you can reach out to the MCOs like a Mary Health, MedStar or whoever else was in DC at the time. So I reached out to the CEOs and I says, look, I'm a chiropractor. I'm interested in being a part of your, uh, provide, your, your network. There's a lot, I live and work in Southeast Washington, DC. Is there a way that I can promote um, chiropractic and be able to service your constituents within this community uh, for them to have that care and you pay for it? And they agreed. So Mary Health was the first one to jump on board to really agree to have us in network. And we were able to, at that time, um, be able to um, gather, you know, obtain patients and have free access to healthcare, both to and from chiropractic from for us to them and, you know, constituents to us. So it, it was great to see that because it was a hurdle yeah. that we've been trying to, uh, to cross for so many years. And we're still looking to the we're still looking to have parity within Medicaid that still hadn't come to, to fruition yet. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's a matter of uh, Mr. Wayne Turnage and you know, the other powers that be that create these other, you know, that have, that have the ability to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They have the ability to make the decision to, to have it or to not have it, right. if that makes any sense. Absolutely. So that's where we are. Oh, and you are the first African-American woman to be elected to the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Boards. Um, tell me about that accomplishment and why is that so significant to have representation on those boards? Well, yeah, so thank you for that, number one. So as the chair of the Board of Chiropractic in Washington, DC, um, there are opportunities that have become available to you on, in the regulatory world, mm -hmm. as well as the educational world um, in higher education. And so I became very active um, within the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Board back in 2011, I think, 2011, I believe it was, when I went to my first meeting in Baltimore, the first annual meeting, mm -hmm. and I saw a sea of chiropractors. Um, it was never my desire to become a, a director or even pursue any uh, uh, leadership position. And so I kind of walked into um, wanting to become more involved in regulation and promulgating policy uh, on a national level and uh, creating, you know, just just different languages and and seeing how I could really uh, provide my input mm -hmm. um, and different perspective when it comes to regulation and just being an African American in general being of ethnic difference. Right. Um, and when I went to these meetings, you basically saw a sea of old white males and females, and and that's what the pro the profession mostly consists of. Mm -hmm. And so I, I I I always integrate well with wherever I am. So I'm never how you say, I'd never feel strange wherever I am. I just insert myself and do, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, but how I became the, uh, now the vice president, um, I was just elected vice president back in May, um, but I, I got involved. I met people, I was friendly. Um, I wanted to make change. I was a change maker. Um, I brought a lot of energy to the table and people saw that. And um, I was the one who always took pictures of, you know, people at the events. Mm -hmm. And um, just by taking pictures, people love to be involved and people love to be a part of. And I found that taking pictures, just because I like doing it, yeah. it brought people together. It just one thing led to another and I ran for office. Um, as the alternate director in California at the annual meeting there, I won that position. And, and then from that point, I went from the alternate director to director um, and then um, eventually the vice pre um, the treasurer of the organization and now the vice president. Wow. Um, today. So um, why it's important for to see African-Americans in leadership or ethnics in leadership positions is because uh, chiropractic is made, I think leadership should reflect the population that's out there, who you represent. And having this position, number one, allows people to see my face number one, but number two, to see that we have something to offer. And diversity to me means more than just a, a black face or a, a yellow face or a white face. It means um, what is your background? What is your, your socioeconomical background? What is your experiences? And, and all these other things that, that create or consist of diversity. Mm -hmm. And when others see me out there, they can look at me as a role model to say, look, I can do that too. Right. And so my goal is to have to see more African-Americans and more ethnics in general in these leadership positions, because when you're in leadership, there's 
the power to make change. And so as long as you're the worker bee, you're not able to really make that change. But when you're in leadership roles, you're able to promulgate policy or um, you begin to create that change that you want to see. When the world sees that you're really trying to be a part of and trying to be inclusive, right. then I believe that opportunities are limitless. And I want to shift and pivot a little bit to talk about your own health and your own health journey and journey to healing as well. You shared with me that you have an autoimmune condition. Talk to me a little bit about your diagnosis and how it's impacted your life to date. So I don't claim to have lupus anymore. I just don't want to claim that. But the reality is that I was diagnosed with lupus at the age of 13. And the journey has been tumultuous. Um, it's been um, quite, a, quite a journey. And I will say this, looking at the beginning to the end of it, that I've been truly, God has truly been um, my saving grace, my family, my faith, um, um, learning how to manage uh, an autoimmune condition um, throughout these many, many years, and even now, uh, managing stress, uh, which is a huge uh, factor in creating disease processes or, you know, waking up the beast, so to speak. So when I was diagnosed, I was like, okay, great, I got this disease. I'm going to beat this thing. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to beat it anyway. Right. Until I got my first bout. I woke up one morning with severe arthritis. I could not move my joints. And my mom, basically uh, lend that to me playing the flute and doing sports. Mm -hmm. And when it kept going on and on and on, um, and then eventually it got so bad that I had to go to the doctor. Uh, again, I came up, they said, well, maybe she has mono. I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not kissing anybody. So why do I want to have mono? And so long story short, came up with the diagnosis of lupus. Throughout my uh, high school years, my ninth grade year, and my 10th grade year um, were the, probably the worst, um, where I was inflicted with my legs swelled up twice its size, mm -hmm. and my skin came off my legs and my feet, and I was threatened with amputation. I was on a high dosage of steroids um, at the time for the severe inflammation and ended up with psychosis, um, where I thought I was, suicid I was suicidal, I was, you know, had schizophrenic and tendencies and just bipolar, you know, tendencies because of the high dosages of, of, of steroids, which can put you into psychosis. Um, another thing that happened to me when I was in high school that ended with a colostomy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you know what that is, but it's basically when they divert your intestines and they invert them inside out your body mm -hmm. so that you can use the bathroom um, outside your body. I had ended up with an ischial rectal abscess, which led to the colostomy, um, so to speak. And so I had the colostomy and was in a wheelchair at the same time. So you can imagine being in high school right. where you're going through your, you know, your puberty Mm -hmm. um, having to be in a wheelchair and having a colostomy at the same time and not really knowing how to really manage the colostomy. So there were accidents that happened. Um, and I had to wear a wig because all my hair came out. So I had all these things that were happening at the same time. So you can imagine my self-esteem, yeah. um, was pretty much, mm, it, it was, it was pretty much uh, gone. <laughs> um. And then I had, you know, students that tried to pull my wig off and just a lot of teasing, and so I had a lot of um, issues in high school, but I still had the dream of becoming a doctor and still getting out that wheelchair and um, becoming great. Yeah. And I think the worst part of it was when my skin came off my legs and my feet, I was actually praying for death yeah. because the pain was so severe um, that I would pray for death because it was just so bad. And then it got so bad when my mom couldn't take care of me and I had to actually be put into the hospital because I had to get my legs scrubbed every day like a burn victim mm -hmm. um, to help help promote the healing process. Mm -hmm. And so um, through that, I learned to moan. Um, my mom fed me a really clean diet. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, but I know that when I was in a lot of pain and a lot of people who were in a lot of pain, they moan and they, 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 they have this humming sound because uh, the humming seems to kind of diffuse some of that pain. Yes, right. And as I look, as I, as I, look fast forward now and I listen to the megahertz music, uh, the 528s or the 432s megahertz, you listen to those tones and they're healing frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so had I, I had no idea I was doing that mm -hmm. wow. during the time I was in a lot of pain. Um, so during this time, like I said before, um, I have a twin brother. So my biggest thing was, uh, my biggest accomplishment at that time would be to graduate on time with my twin brother. 
And I said, God, if you, if you don't kill me, you must heal me because I can't take this too much longer. And so he healed me. Mm. So I, my legs weren't amputated. I never got a skin graft. Mm. Um, the colostomy was reversed my sophomore year in college. Um, I walked with my brother in high school at graduation. Um, I found out who my true friends were because um, my, my worst enemies became my best friends. And my best friends were, you know, no longer my best friends anymore. That, that relationship kind of waned. Mm -hmm. But I really found out who I was. I, I learned to, I matured a lot faster than my, than my, my counterparts. Mm -hmm. And so it gave me a true appreciation for life, uh, for beauty. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a model when I was younger. And my legs were destroyed. My face was destroyed because of the lupus malar rash. My hair came out. So the things that I thought were beautiful on me once before, they no longer existed. Mm -hmm. um, but then my beauty came back, but beauty became deeper than just skin. It became more or less the, the soul, the character, your values. Um, and those things became, um, my top priorities. Mm -hmm. And I never was a real vain person anyway, but I think that that journey led me to where I am today, being able to understand. And even through my care for my patients of, I've been there, I've been crazy before I've had psychosis before I've been. Um, so sick that I wanted to die. I've been suicidal before. Mm -hmm. I've had where I wanted to just lock myself up and just like go away because um, the pain was so severe. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to my patients. So when patients talk to me about back pain or they're psychosomatically uh, in more pain because of their, they have more mental issues because of the pain they're experiencing, I've been there. So I can relate, relate to them. And it makes me a better doctor because now I'm able to communicate with them in a way that shows them that I'm empathetic, but I'm also sympathetic. Mm -hmm. So it really helps in so many different ways. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your story and in so much transparency and detail. But I know that so many people with autoimmune conditions have very debilitating symptoms. Um, and like you mentioned, has you know changed their appearance in some way. So they've had to they're redefining what beauty is, which I think is so important that we have a conversation around because we live in a society that, you know, really puts on a pedestal a certain image. And when you have a chronic issue or an autoimmune issue in particular that strips that away from you, you really have to, you know, come to terms with what your definition is. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you came to that realization for yourself. And obviously you went through this very challenging time. I imagine there must've been a, a point where you made the decision to redefine what beauty is, redefine what ability looks like. So there was a time, um, I, th I believe it was my ninth grade year where I had to learn how to literally write again. Um, and of course, walk again. And um, I remember the first time after the colostomy was reversed, and even my legs, when they started to heal up, mm -hmm. um, going outside with a bikini mm -hmm. and going to the beach with a bikini and showing my legs and my feet with all the scarring and people would just stare. Um, even through wearing wigs, sometimes I would go bald, sometimes I wouldn't. Um, and throughout the years, my, my hair came out approximately three, three different times. Mm -hmm. And so wearing a wig was basically, I felt like my hair was my beauty. And um, when that got taken away, I had to redefine, like you said, redefine what, what beauty was for me and finding different wigs and different styles and becoming comfortable with that. And, and you remember living single with uh, yes. Deja and all them and how Regine would always change her wigs like three times a day or whatever. And she would just style them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I would love to have the, the attitude and the, just the confidence that she has to wear different wigs and not look the same all the time. Mm -hmm. and that became part of what I did I started getting different wigs I started just experimenting mm -hmm. uh, with different clothes and even my body just like just going out and just going all out and not being afraid of it at, at all at, mm -hmm. at, anymore just being comfortable in my own skin and even now um, my hair came out three times and it grew back and this time I still wear wigs now today because over the last 12 years my scalp has been um, changing with the lupus that, that took my skin it basically, when my period came on, mm -hmm. my scalp would literally inflame and peel off, literally. So two weeks out of the month, my scalp would be on fire mm -hmm. and um, my scalp would eventually peel off and my, it left a lot of scarring. So there's a lot of scars on my scalp and there's some hair, but there's a lot of scars too. So I don't just go around bald anymore. But 
things that happen in your life do change the way you look at things and you just understand that really the what really matters is the soul yeah. and your spirit um that's what really matters mm-hmm. and um so all the superficiality is as far as um your skin your hair all those things even though i still desire to have my hair back okay. um i'm okay with not having it mm-hmm. but i still work towards my health yeah. and my just being healthy and whole and my mental and spiritual health that's the most important thing for me right now at this point yeah. is am i being a good human being am i creating an environment of wholeness and of health and wellness and, and inclusion and acceptance mm-hmm. am i creating that environment and that's what's most important to me at this point in my life it sounds like you had those moments like those revelations and turning points but do you do you feel like you're still on that journey of acceptance do you feel like you've come to terms fully and you're you've sort of arrived if so to speak i believe i have um you look at my life and i, and I think people may want to ask the question what about boyfriends what about your husband well um i, I did it a rock star a pop star back in um when i was 33 mm-hmm. and he was a european from europe and um anyway he wanted to date me he's like oh you're so beautiful he always was touch my neck and like this that never behind my neck and stuff he's like you know why do you always move when I do that? I says, look, <laughs> I'll tell you one day. I said, look, in a couple of days, let's have a conversation mm-hmm. and I'll tell you about who I am and what I am and what's going on. He says, well, come over for, come over for dinner. I'm going to have you over for, for dinner. We'll have a cookout. So we did. And I told him everything. I said, look, I had lupus. I don't have any hair. And um, he said, I said, this is who I am. And this is my, the scars of my body. And this is what I'm dealing with. And, and this is who I am. He said, take off your hair. Mm. <laughs> I said, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, take your wig off. He, I took my wig off. Yeah. And he did the most beautiful thing that mm-hmm. I could not have imagined. He took me to his arms. He kissed my head. Mm-hmm. He says, Kita, you're beautiful. He said, it's not your hair. It's you that I am falling in love with. Mm. I was like, whoa. I <laughs> that changed my perspective on everything. And that really helped me to understand that it's not your hair. Yeah. It's what's inside that matters. And I had another boyfriend prior that who didn't care. Um, my hair was coming out at the time. And my husband today, mm-hmm. he's just an amazing man. He doesn't even care. Mm. And I walk around the house with no hair on back in North Carolina with no hair on. And it's just so freeing to just understand and believe and to to trust and know that it's not about the outer that matters. It's what's inside. And for those of you out there who are suffering or struggling with your appearance, whether it's boils on your body or scars or whatever it is, just being owning who you are, Mm -hmm. I think is the most important thing that you can ever try to develop um because when you know who you are no one can point the finger and say "Ooh, look at you look at you look at you because i've already taken ownership of it Mm -hmm. it is what it is i am who i am (laughs) so um so i own who i am i I don't i don't have no i don't have those insecurities so much anymore about if my wig falls off when i'm outside or if it blows off i don't have those insecurities anymore i'll just pick it up and put it back on you know what i'm saying (laughs) so it's like it is what it is yeah, I'm hearing, you know, your faith is strong and that has uh, had a huge influence. I'm hearing there's humor there. You've learned to laugh at life and, you know, situations that have come about. And I think probably because you've been through such a tremendous traumatic experience as a child going through all the things you went through with dealing with lupus. Is there anything else, any other piece of advice that you'd give someone else who's living with a chronic issue or an autoimmune issue in particular? I'm going to say this and it's getting on a spiritual level. It's basically this is your, your body is just a shell. Mm. Um, there is spirit that lives within each of you. And your spirit is greater than whatever physical thing you're going through at any moment in time. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to understand and really get to know who you are, what you're placed here for, and asking God for what your purpose is and letting that purpose be fulfilled. And um, that's my advice I can give because at this point in my life right now, I'm beginning to become to go within a lot more to really understand who it is that I am right. and who I am becoming every single day. And this 
this is going to pass. Yeah. It's going to pass. But what you give to others and what you, um, what you're able to share with others and give them that's positive and whole and good and that's going to take them to the next level in their level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to last. Mm -hmm. And so take care of your body, whatever you can do to take care of your health and your well-being. That's most important because that's how you become closer to God and the spirit within right. is by taking care of this temple. And so um, that gives me hope every single day that when I feel like I'm spiraling out, I have to take a check, check in and Peter, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you eating? What are you drinking? checking in because that really helps you to see how connected you are to spirit right. and how connected you are to really being true to who you really are, your, your true self. Well, thank you again, Dr. Vanderpool, for your time. I really appreciate just the outpouring of your passion for what you do and your experience and expertise in chiropractic care. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Emily. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.